with the brand new Football League show presented by Manish Basin. Good evening and a warm welcome to the brand new Football League show as we aim to bring you every goal across all three divisions. And by the way, there's only 95 just to squeeze in tonight. Uh, over the next 40 weeks, we'd also love to hear from you. Have you got the right manager in charge? Have you got the right players in the team, perhaps? What about your result this afternoon? Here's Lizzie Greenwood-Hughes as to how you can get in touch. You can text us on 81111 or send us an email to footballleague at bbc.co.uk. And we would particularly like to hear from Newcastle fans tonight. After all the chaos that's been going on at the club, how are you feeling now the season is finally underway? And from the other leagues, we'd also really like to hear from Norwich City, Notts County and Gillingham fans. I don't want to give too much away, but anyone who's seen the scores from those matches will know why we want to hear from you. But whoever you support in the Football League, make sure you get in touch with us. This is your chance to have your say. Yeah, more from Lizzie a little later. Well, joining me tonight, a man who knows the Football League inside out. He's played for 19 different clubs and featured in well over a thousand games. A warm welcome to Steve Claridge. And alongside Steve, fresh from his emotional return to former club Queen's Park Rangers, the Blackpool manager Ian Holloway. Here's what's coming up tonight. Six months ago to the day, Newcastle travelled to West Brom for what was then the Premier League clash. Today they met on the opening day of the championship season and had to settle for a point. They played the name game at Derby today as Clough. No, not that one, but son Nigel took on Ferguson. No, not that one, but son Darren, who took his newly promoted Peterborough side to play family fortunes. Out with the old and in with the new. I'm Mark Clement, and I'm going to be spending the day at Cardiff City's swanky new £50 million stadium. Well, Steve, as I mentioned a little earlier, 95 goals on, on the opening day of the Football League season. What a start. Absolutely fantastic. I think anybody who has any sort of interest in the Football League thought that this season had the potential you know, to be very exciting. And if, the, if today was anything to go by... Then we're in for a hell of a ride, aren't we? Ollie, you've taken a year out, haven't you? A sabbatical, as some people put it, for the last 12 months. I'm glad to be back in the mix. Oh, it was fantastic today. I'm a, a little bit hoarse, but I um, had a great reception from uh, QPR, but we, they just nicked a goal off us in the end, so probably a draw was a fair result, but it's great to be back. Yeah, it's great to have you here as well. What are you looking forward to most this season, Steve? I, th I think it's just the unpredictability of, of, of all the leagues. I mean, it, every league seems to have... Some, something happening in it that, that's of interest. You know, we've got Sven in the bottom league, we've got some big clubs in, in Division One, and of course, we know the unpredictability of the Championship. I mean, three teams, only three teams have, have won those, their, their opening matches in the Championship. So it's, it's a fantastic start for everybody, and I think it's going to be a thoroughly entertaining season right throughout the leagues. Well, you mentioned the big teams. No doubt the big talking point in the Championship is Newcastle. Who will buy them? Who will be their manager? And can they bounce back at the first time of asking? Well, we got some sort of pointer to that last question, at least, when they travelled to West Brom, a game you might have seen a little earlier here on BBC One. Well, the minute's applause in memory of Sir Bobby Robson held across the country was even more poignant here, as Newcastle and Sir Bobby will forever be associated. Commentary comes from Mark Lawrenson and Guy Mowbray. Angus Olsen once again is a really big threat from this sort of position. Greening in, Olsen jumping, Harper got there, blocked on the line, and Shelton Martis has stabbed the ball home. Newcastle undone by a set piece. Angus Olsen and Martis reacted quickly. Yeah, it's the first ball, really, that causes the goal from West Brom's point of view. It was very difficult for Newcastle to deal with. I think 
Hoff has actually been kicked by his own player, but Martis was the one who was more determined than anyone. Harper's back to his feet. Away, unchallenged by Chris Wood. Corrin. Jose Enrique. Confronted by Malumbu and then Greening. Smith is able to dig it out to Amiobi. Gutierrez wants it wide. Amiobi found Nolan in a better position. Now Damien Day! I think it's Kevin Nolan who eventually gets a ball guy and he, he gets his head up in a great position and he just picks Duff out. Just way to pass is brilliant. Oh, no. Greening's corner, cruel, flat tatted a little. Did he make the save? I think he did. I think he made the second save, no doubt about it. He flapped at the first one. And I think he's got the smallest of fingertips on this. Greening stands over the ball. Greening will swing it over. Jonas Olsen is there! And the flag's gone up, has it? No, Mike Dean has seen some pushing. Roberto Di Matteo saw it early enough not to celebrate. West Bromwich Albion are denied a winner. Offside. Offside. I think Mike Dean indicated pushing at first, but the flag was up for offside. As that uh, ball went in the net at the very end there, in the very final second of added time, you, you might have been forgiven for feeling that uh, it had kicked you when you were down, so to speak. Uh, yeah, very much so. I think mm, I didn't see that the flag go up uh, instantly and uh, I've turned away uh, thinking it was a goal. And, um, and then I was reminded by somebody that, um, that it wasn't and uh, I haven't had an opportunity to, to see it again. But uh, yeah, certainly we're, we're, we're thankful. But, but I think we, we got what we deserve today, you know, and to come here... As I say, a very good side and, and uh, a side that I'm sure will do very well in this division. And to get a draw on the opening day, I think, is a, a credit to, to this group of lads. Yeah, two teams there looking to bounce straight back. Which of the two managers would have been happier at the end of the 90 minutes, Steve? Probably, I'm not, probably Roberto Di Matteo, simply because Newcastle in open play thoroughly dominated the game. But, you know, you, what you've got to say is, oddly, it was a Newcastle reserve keeper who came on second half substitute, yeah, Tim Krull, who pulled off three fantastic saves. But overall, I think the, the way that the two sides played, there were more positives from a Newcastle aspect than there, than there were, probably were from West Brom. Which of those two sides are you least looking forward to playing against, Ollie? Um, if I could play Newcastle quickly, I probably would, because you know, they, they need to make a decision on who the manager is going to be and is he going to keep it, is he going to sell it. Um, and obviously, the longer... Roberto gets there, the more his players will understand what he wants. So, uh, but both of them are going to be candidates to, to go up. I Do think. You, you agree? I, I, I'm, I'm exactly of that opinion. I think that those two sides will be there or thereabouts. Certainly, Newcastle. There was, a, there was a lot of character, a lot of spirit, a lot of fight, and there, there were plenty of things to take from that game from their side. And we know West Brom are well versed at this level. They're used to getting out of that league, mm. so those two should, on that that performance, be up there. Well, that Newcastle goal was quality as well. It was, yeah. Fantastic ball from Nolan, great finish. So two of the relegated teams there share the honours. Last night, Middlesbrough, the other team to drop down from the Premier League, opened up their campaign with a goalless draw against Sheffield United. Well, it was a game of few chances. Mark Yates uh, might have given Borough an early lead, but for the fingertips of Mark Bunn. Danny Coyne in the Middlesbrough goal returned the favour with a good save from Stephen Quinn. Burroughs' Adam Johnson had a strong penalty appeal rejected when he got in behind Kyle Walker. What do you think here, Steve? Certainly a bit of foot and ball in that. Mm, yeah, I, I would probably have heard on the side of caution. After that, and both managers happy enough to start the season with a point and a clean sheet. So we've seen how the three relegated clubs got along, but what about the promoted teams? Peterborough ended last season like an absolute train and Darren Ferguson took his team to Derby to open up their season. Jake Buxton, Dean Moxie and Lee Croft all made their championship debuts for Derby while Darren Ferguson gave Charlie Lee, Dean Keats and Craig McHale Smith a nod for their first foray in the championship. Martin Fisher is your commentator. The return of the football season sees the return of the sunshine. Not sure what we've missed the most over the summer, but the 
fans here keen to make the most of both this afternoon. A near 33,000 sellouts at Pride Park. How they love their football in Derby. Forward by Savage. Awkward this for Zakwani. No real challenge from anybody in white. Conley looking to release Croft, who's managed to shake off Williams initially. Wins Derby their first corner. And Nigel Clough was chasing the signature of Lee Croft ever since last season came to an end. Let's see what he can conjure with this first corner. Nothing initially, but hooked backwards by Buxton. And Green provides Teal. Derby with plenty of bodies in that Peterborough penalty area. Green will float it across. Up goes Buxton and Addison's there! And Derby County take the lead. Miles Addison, the goal scorer, inside the opening five minutes of the game. Well, he's taken the knock in knocking this home. And the jubilation around the ground is momentarily silenced. Good ball in here from Green. And headed back across there by Buxton to the other central defender, Miles Addison. And Addison gets Derby off and running early on on the opening day. And Peterborough caught cold in the August heat. And having had treatment, Miles Addison off the pitch momentarily. Addison needs to keep a careful watch. The header down as far as McLean. Here now is Tommy Rowe and the equaliser. The flag is up though, George Boyd's joy is cut short. For a split second there, Peterborough thought they'd level. Nice approach by Tommy Rowe, and you can see as the ball's just whipped in there, George Boyd fractionally ahead of Buxton. Ferguson saw his team win 12 times on their travels last season. In fact, they had a very similar record away from home as they did at London Road. Here's Teal for Derby. Amazing dribble and a teasing cross. And Davis didn't gamble, and he done. Teal might have just helped Derby go two in front. Fantastic run this by the Scotsman. Peterborough's confidence notably grew as that first half wore on. They've been penned back inside their own half for the opening three or four minutes of this second half. They'll know they need to keep a close eye on Commons. What a lovely ball through for Teal. Far post is Davis, just wants it squared. Ball hasn't got the legs, and it's easy for Zakwani to clear. Really should have done better there, Derby. Fabulous play by Commons, and Teal failed to capitalise. Peterborough very much still in this game. Paul Coots. Thought about the shot and hits it. Plenty of power behind that one for Paul Coots. Had that one gone in, it would have been his first ever goal for Peterborough. And it would have been an absolute belter. Time for Zakwani. Bywater's come a long way, and he's not got there. And it's a penalty. Bywater tumbling into Sean Batts. No need to go that far, surely. Connie looks in charge of that. And Bywater slides in against Bat, who was really not threatening the goal, was he? And referee Paul Taylor points to the spot. Bywater, the villain of the piece, can he turn things round completely and be the hero by saving this spot kick? George Boyd to take it. Boyd scores. Peace for a level. Their second half pressure merits the equaliser with eight minutes left of the 90. Sending the goalkeeper the wrong way. And George Boyd, who helped himself to 10 last season, gets Peterborough goals tally off and running this. Is there to be a winner? Appeals for handball. 
against Williams. He points to his head and the referee agrees. Corner given. Just lost his balance as Keel skipped beyond him. Derby's tenth corner. Commons with it. Lewis Kane! Commons after Zakwani's needless hesitation. Left leg doing the trick there, but when it cannoned back off Williams, it almost embarrassed Lewis with his control. The managers have barely changed their positions all game. Hook back across by Williams, this time Connolly to clear. There goes the final whistle. Cluffy gets the better of Fergie. On opening day in the Championship, Derby off to a winning start after such awful seasons in the recent past. Disappointment for the Championship new boys. On opening day at Pride Park, it's Derby 2, Peterborough 1. Well, Nigel, it's the first time Derby have won on the opening day for seven years. <laughs> what a ding-dong battle that was. It was incredible. Uh, I think the only mystery is how it finished only 2-1. Uh, it was a 4-4-5 forward sort of job out there today. Not just the amount of chances created, but the situations uh, which weren't converted into chances. I've got to look at the performance. It's not, in my mind, doesn't come far away from the result. Obviously, the result is the most important thing. But if we hadn't got a performance that I know we're capable of in any part of the game, it would have worried me more. But... If we play like that, I'm sure we'll win more games than we lose. So, good start for Nigel Clough in his first full season in charge. Is that going to be heightened expectations now at Pride Park after what his, you know, his dad did there? I don't think it is. I think there's a, there's a long-term plan there. And Adam Pearson, I heard him on the radio today, and he was saying, I, I think that patience is a virtue at that club, um, and they're going to give Nigel time. He took ten years to turn Burton round. Mm. You know, he did it you know, up for, from virtually from scratch. I think that's what he's going to do there. He wants a tighter unit. I think he's, he knows a certain place that he wants to keep, a certain place that he wants to get out, but he certainly wants a tighter unit, and that's what he'll aim to get, and he won't be in any sort of rush, and I don't think the public or the, or the people above Nigel are in a rush there at all anyway. It's interesting with Peter, but Darren Ferguson is stuck by those lower league players that have served him so well, successive promotions. Uh, could this be a step too far for them or is it still too early, uh, early days for them at the minute? Uh, you can't you can tell on, on one game, you can't really tell on five or six games. You know, when, Once you've played eight to ten, you can have a good look and, and see what you need. But his, his lads deserve a chance at a higher level. And, Let's not kid ourselves, that's unlucky, really. Mm. That was very close to being a, a, a draw away at Derby, which is a tough fixture. So they'll find their feet, and they're quality players. So um, I'm sure it'll be OK. All right, let's see how the two other teams to come up from League One got on, starting with Scunthorpe, who travelled to Cardiff, who are unveiling a brand-new stadium, as Mark Clement reports. Thanks for the lift, lads. No great upheaval for Cardiff fans in terms of finding their new ground. It's only 100 yards from the last one. Far less familiar surroundings, though, when you step inside. Almost a third of England's top four division clubs have now moved to new grounds since, in fact, today's visitors Scunthorpe started the trend in 1988. This place cost £50 million. Pounds. It's got a current capacity of 27,000, and it's taken just two years to build. People talk about stadiums, they talk about how much they cost to build, but we've delivered this on time, on budget, and here we are with a stadium which, frankly, this is life-saving for the football club. Without this stadium, our debts would have completely uh, consumed the football club and it wouldn't have been here. Will you let us have a little glimpse of your inner sanctum? Of course. With oh, pleasure. Come on, let's go through. 
Oh, everybody's standing to attention. I feel as though I'm feeling under I think that's for you, not for me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the chairman's suite. Uh, I never sit down before a match. I'm too excited, but uh, I'm too nervous. I'm worried about you, Peter. You don't have Worry. anything to eat at all. Nothing beforehand. I just can't. Too no. nervous? Yeah, very much so. I'm going to pop down and try and see the manager. Is he normally OK on match day, or does he get quite grumpy? No, he's fine. He's just the opposite of me, actually. He's very calm and cool before the match. It's uh, during the match and after the match that Dave gets excited. We'll pop and see him. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dave, are you pinching yourself? It's finally come together. It's here. You're going to play the first league game in this magnificent place. No, I'm delighted to be here. I'm not pinching myself. I think it's more a case of we just want to get the business rolling now. We've tried to try and make it as much of our home as we possibly can, but we need to take some more pictures, get some more pictures up on the walls. Just generally make it ours. There he well, is. Well, you right, look at you before. Now now then. Then. I thought you got from radio to TV. A radio, TV. Oh, the face still... to TV and radio. Can't be bad. Look at you. You've got a nice shirt on there as well. Well, I've that. had to make just that little bit of effort. Now, listen, are you here to be party pooper on this big day for Cardiff? We've come here to win a game of football. Simple as. Magnificent stadium, isn't it? Look at it. It's going to be bouncing. I hope the supporters really enjoy it because the players at this moment in time are awesome. Absolutely awesome. I, I never thought I'd see the day. It's all right from the outside, so uh, see what it's like with the atmosphere inside after, isn't it? So this is the acid test for Cardiff City. They've got their acts together off the field. Can they do the same on it? First up at the new Cardiff City Stadium, then we League One playoff winners Scunthorpe. A team looking to cause a surprise on their return to the championship. But the Bluebirds took the early lead. Michael Chopper didn't know too much about it as he deflected a shot from Peter Whittingham. Lee McCormack's hinted he fancies a Premier League move. And on this form, there were plenty of willing takers as he excelled in an unfamiliar left midfield position. He began the move, ended by Jay Bothroyd, giving the home side a two-goal lead from close range. Cardiff's end-of-season run denied them a place in the playoffs by just one goal, but those thoughts soon forgotten in their new home, record signing Chopra grabbing his second after being set up by Bothroyd's back heel. Cardiff's biggest crowd since 1971 were in full voice, and they had even more to cheer when Martin Wolford fouled Ian Morris for a late Cardiff penalty. Peter Whittingham scored to make it 4-0. It's in most of the 22,000 crowd home happy and gave Dave Jones a winning start. We've still got a lot of work ahead of us. We're not kidding ourselves because of the result today. Because I thought Scunthorpe played some really good football to begin with. And once we'd knocked the stuffing out of them, it was always going to be probably damage limitations for them. The other promoted team are Leicester, who came up as champions of League One. Manager Nigel Pearson wants a playoff place this season, but Swansea took the lead early on. Former centre-half Pearson won't like the defending here. Ashley Williams unmarked to convert Mark Gower's corner. Leicester lost just one match at home last season and were given the chance to get back on terms when goalscorer Williams brought down Swiss fullback Bruno Berner. Matt Fryatt's half-time substitution meant strike partner Steve Howard took on the responsibility. He was denied by Dutch goalkeeper Doris de Vries. Leicester did draw level on 68 minutes. Pearson made two attacking changes at half-time. Both with a score, and State claims to start the Foxes' next game. First loan signing Martin Waghorn scoring via Gary Monk's wicked deflection. And just three minutes later, Leicester had the lead. French winger Danny Ungessen signed from Lincoln with the Foxes' second after good work from Howard. Ungessen nearly crowned a great debut with a second goal, the crossbar feeling the full force of his header here. Even so, the Foxes held on to record a first home win over the Swans for 59 years. So, Steve, your former club, Leicester, up and running, and it bodes well for Nigel Pearson. Two new signings scoring on their debuts. Yes, yes, Danny and Gesson and Martin Waghorn, mm. um, both from different backgrounds, one from Sunderland and one from Lincoln, but uh, they worked the Oracle, certainly second half, because first half, they were a poor second in that game, but they turned it on its head, and as you say, both goal scorers. That's what the manager's there for, isn't it? Turn, sure. Make it, you know, make the make the changes. And it's for the better. Good win for Cardiff today against Scunthorpe, and I suppose Cardiff's job now is to replicate that Ninian Park atmosphere in their new home, isn't it? Well, it's it's been a long time waiting, a long time coming, hasn't it? Even those no supporters very funnily said, "Oh, I don't know, I never thought I'd see it." But you know, Dave Dave's very calm at what he does. They had a, a terrible end to last season, but 
for three quarters of it, they were brilliant. So let's not forget that, and I'm sure they'll be up there or thereabouts by the end of it. As for Scunthorpe, is it a season of struggle ahead, Steve? I mean, they've got one of the smallest budgets in the championship. Well, they've got the smallest budget, I would imagine. And um, I, think, I think that's something that, you know, there is a discrepancy. There's no doubt about it. We think it's just in the Premiership, but it, it's not. It can be in all the leagues. You know, there are certain managers, and their brief will just be to stay in that division. And Scunthorpe will be one of them. OK, let's pay our first visit to Lizzie for your emails and texts. Lizzie, what are the viewers saying? Well, we've had literally hundreds of emails, Manish. Thank you very much for everyone watching who's been sending them in. Lots of them, of course, from Newcastle, but not as gloomy as you might think. And lots of them actually asking for Shearer to come in. One here from Matthew and Amber. He says, at least we didn't lose today, but we need Shearer in desperately. Ben says, I'm relieved that the season is finally underway and says, I think we're going to have a decent season as long as we still don't have Hewton or Joe Kinnear again. Big Al is the only man for the job. And uh, Anthony, who calls himself a frustrated Toon fan, says we have Alan Shearer wanting to take on the challenge but Mike Ashley is still hanging on to his £100 million price tag. Anthony says, give Shearer the job and I bet the club will sell. One here, a little bit of a strange one. I'm not sure if anyone else noticed this, but Zane, who's a Newcastle fan, says, did anyone else notice that Tim Kroll had a wasp crawling on his right shoulder in the second half, which then stung him onto the neck and it didn't seem to phase him at all? Well, well done, if that is true, Tim Kroll. Got to talk about Cardiff here. Guy in Monmouth says, it's not just about poor old Newcastle. There was a great atmosphere at the new Cardiff City Stadium today. The fans of turned it into Ninian Park 2, an arena of noise, says Guy. And finally, one here from a Peterborough fan. He says, I'm not worried about their defeat to Derby at all. As a posh fan, I feel today's game was a starting block for a great season. Well done to you, and thanks for all those emails coming in. Thanks, Lizzie. I think that wasp stung Tim Krull into action today. Uh, well, Ian here wasn't exactly a happy man when he walked into our studio earlier this evening. And this is the reason why Dan O'Hagan reports. Ian Holloway received a warm reception on his return to QPR, although his former club dominated early proceedings. Heide Helgeson scored a brace the last time these two sides met, the woodwork stopping him opening the scoring. Blackpool's only previous win at Loftus Road came all the way back in 1972. It was the Seasiders here who opened the scoring against the run of play. Ben Burgess opening his account after fine work by Gary Taylor Fletcher. Goals were QPR's problem last season. It was looking like a familiar story for Ars fans as Angelo Balanta hit the side netting just before half-time. Paul Rahubka was having a man-of-the-match performance in the Blackpool goal. After pulling off a stunning save to deny Fitzhall, he was relieved to see the post come to the rescue as Balanta fell to ease any opening day nerves. Rowan Vine scored only one goal last season in an injury hit campaign. The striker won't get many better chances than this after being set up by Patrick Aguiman. It was an unlikely source that finally got the goal for QPR five minutes from time. Peter Ramage's cross inadvertently finding the net. The defender's first goal in more than 100 career appearances, sending his manager Jim McGilton's blushes and denying Holloway a fairy tale return. Well, Ollie, I've got to ask you first up, have you had a word with your keeper after that? Um, no, he got on the bus and <laughs> gone back home and I've had to come here. But um, no, it was, it was quite an emotional day, obviously. But. Um, we rode our luck a little bit, as you could see by those chances, and um, it was a bit cruel with, in 87th minute for mm. that, which was a blatant cross to <laughs> loop into our net. But, you know, let's, let's be fair, I would have taken a point before we went, so I'll take a point. Is so you happy with a point? I would have liked three, but that would have been a bit greedy. Yeah, and we, Dan mentioned there, you got a terrific ovation from the QPR fans. That must have been great for you. Oh, uh, it's really nice, you know. I don't know how many managers can go back to certain places and and get the, the warm welcome I got, but uh, I'm sure that'll wear off over was, the years. I was going to say, <laughs> make some of your visits to Plymouth and Leicester oh, this yeah, season. Yeah, I'm not sure which one <laughs> I'm looking forward to the worst. Yeah, uh, talking of which, um, you know, after what happened at Leicester, have you got a point to prove this season with Blackpool? Yeah, I think, I think oh, every, every job you take, you have to keep um, writing a new script. You, you, you can't stand still in life. So um, I got relegated. I don't like it. I've got to try and... Um, take on Blackpool and make sure we don't. Yeah, uh, it's amazing to think you're one of six managers making their debuts in the championship. I mean, that's mind-boggling, isn't oh, it? Oh, it's, 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 a, it's a fantastic prize at the end of it, but that comes at a cost. And, what's your aim this, and what is your aim this season? Is it just to stay up? No, it's, it's, it's to actually get this club moving forward, and I think that's to beat what we did last year, and I think it's to yeah. try and move towards the top of the table. And you've already, Steve's already said it, that you know, Scunthorpe probably got the worst budget. Well. Ours isn't much better than that, but, you know, as I say, we've, we've got some 
serious backing going to be happening and hopefully I can gradually get some new players, add to the ones I've got and um, move up that table. That sounds like you're going to be spending big soon. Well, not big. I, I mean, to other people, they can have someone like Chris Commons at Derby on the bench and um, they bought my captain for quite a few mm. hundred thousand pounds. But, um, you know, we, we might go in with a, a couple of hundred thousand here, a couple of hundred thousand here, do a bit like um, Peter had done, really, take them from lower down and polish them up. Yeah, OK. Well, here's how the rest of the Coca-Cola Championship played out on week one. Sheffield Wednesday had a reasonably positive ahead of the new season. Marcus Tudged signed a new contract, despite interest from Premier League Burnley. The Owls faced Barnsley in the South Yorkshire derby and had a great chance to take the lead early on. Luke Steele saving well from James O'Connor. The Tykes did the double over Wednesday in the league last season. But it took the home team just nine minutes to score the first goal this time. Jamaican Jermaine Johnson with the goal for the Owls. A crowd of 30,000 made for a great atmosphere at Hillsborough. John Macken scored nine goals for the Tykes last season. Wednesday goalkeeper Lee Grant denying him here. Macken and Grant cross swords again soon after. The goalkeeper once again coming out on top. Wednesday's second goal came via a long throw. Tudgay's flick on to Michael Gray. His first Wednesday goal in the week he turned 35. And he was OK to continue. Jacob Butterfield had made just one previous start for Barnsley before today. But the teenage defender given the nod by Simon Davey repaid his manager's faith with a first senior goal. John Macken missed a host of half chances for Barnsley, but all that was forgiven with just a quarter of an hour left to play. A great comeback for Barnsley in front of 5,500 travelling fans, 2-2 the final score. Preston have reached the playoffs in three of the past five years and began this campaign at home to Bristol City. And the Football League founder member almost claimed an early goal. But John Parkin's shot was blocked by Lewis Carey. The home team pressed on in the first half. Defender Yul Mawene somehow steering his shot over the top as the game stayed goalless going into half-time. But the second half would be a cracker. Bristol City failed to win any of their last eight matches last season, but they were given the perfect chance to take the lead when Mawaney was penalised for a challenge on Danny Haynes. Penalty. Paul Hartley signed for the Robins from Celtic during the summer. It was a debut to remember his first goal in English football. David Clarkson also made the move south over the summer, signing for Motherwell, and the Scotland striker made his mark on the championship inside the hour. Danny Haynes with a fine pass, 2-0 now. Preston hadn't lost an opening game for five years, and they gave themselves a chance to keep the record going. John Parkin pulling a goal back in some style. City held their lead until deep into stoppage time. The ball appeared to strike Lewis Carey's hand and referee Michael Oliver pointed to the spot. Callum Davidson stepped up for North End. He kept his cool to secure a dramatic late draw for his team. Three Scotsmen on the score sheet at Deepdale, 2-2 the full-time score. Neil Warnock faced one of his many former clubs, Plymouth, at Selhurst Park. One of his new signings, Stern John, was the first to go close from Alassane Undi's cross. The much-travelled John heading just wide. His debut truncated with a suspected broken arm later on. 
It's rare for Warnock sides to leap goals from set plays. Hungarian Christian Timar scoring for Argyle with the season just five minutes old. Only Timar's fourth goal for the club, his first for two seasons, the perfect start. Plymouth could have doubled their lead when Jamie Mackey found space on the left-hand side. Palace keeper Julian Speroni with a save, showing why he's been the Eagles' player of the season for the last two years in a row. The goalkeeper kept the Devonians at bay with some sharp reflexes. Rory Fallon denied here. And those saves proved a platform for a Palace leveller. Victor Moses with the deep cross for Alan Lee's head. And there are few finer headers than Lee at this level, all square at Selhurst Park. A strong finish ensured Doncaster's first season in the Championship ended with safety long assured. A trip to Malky Mackay's Watford began the new campaign. The Hornets warmed up with a win against Italian Serie A team Palmer a week ago and Danny Graham put them ahead with a goal on his Hornets debut. But Donny came south in determined mood. Brian Stock sent in the cross. And how's that for a header from James Hayter? Two ex-Bournemouth players in neat combination. Tommy Smith was Watford's top scorer last season. This attempted cross nearly becoming a whole lot more. Goalkeeper Neil Sullivan, a relieved man. There was one last chance for Rovers to take all three points, but Dean Shields' effort somehow kept out by goalkeeper Scott Loach as the game finished all square at Vicarage Road. Reading and Nottingham Forest met on the first day of last season. That day there were no goals as both teams adjusted to life in a new division. Chances again few and far between this year at the Medeski Stadium. New signing David McGoldrick had the best effort of the first half for Forest. New Reading boss Brendan Rodgers fielded a young team including Scott Davis who had scored against Chelsea in a friendly last week. But the Irishman failed to beat Forest goalkeeper Lee Camp. Forrest Luke Chambers had already seen yellow and he was involved in an off-the-ball incident with Reading sub Shane Long. <laughs> Referee Phil Crossley was left distinctly nonplussed. And a second yellow made red. Reading and Forrest start this season as they did last with a goalless draw. So a point uh, for Brendan Rodgers' first game in charge at Reading. He's got some big boots to fill out the Medeski, hasn't he? I wouldn't like to follow Steve Coppel myself. I think he's a fantastic manager and hopefully he'll get back in when, he, when he's ready. But um, good luck to Brendan. He did a fantastic job at, at Watford. You know, a few eyebrows were raised when he got the job, but um, he's a great fella. And I wish him all the best. That is a big club. Just reflecting on some of the results in the Championship, Steve. Seven draws today, one mm. yesterday, eight in all. An indicator as to how close this season is going to be? Yes, I think so. I mean, it's, 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 it's going to be very difficult for anybody to, to, to dominate this league, I think. We are, we are going to get some unpredictable results. Um, I think probably if you had to put me on the spot, I think the, 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 the quality game today was... I thought newcastle West Brom was a good game. I, I think probably out of, out of all the teams, I'd say, what, what we saw today, mm. they're probably the two that you would, you would at, at, on that performance, say would be up there. Do you expect a, a more closely fought campaign than last season, Ollie? I can't see anybody really running away with it. I think they'll be, it'll be closer, there'll be more teams involved. Um, but as Steve said, the quality of those two teams with the money that they're paying, that should show by the end of the day. But, you know, you've got to sort your act out. Yeah. Newcastle need to sort their life out and who's going to be their manager. Finally, a special mention for Ian Hume of Barnsley, obviously six months out after that horrendous head injury. Uh, he only made the bench for Barnsley, but good to see him at least vying for a place because obviously he played with you at Atlas. Oh, he's a wonderful kid and, you know, freak accident, call it what you like, but no one wants to see that. I don't think anyone would deliberately do what happened in that game, but um, the, the, the scar he's got, as long as he's OK, no one's really going to worry, but good luck to him from all of us, isn't it? Yeah. OK, time to catch up with some more emails and text messages from fans of Championship sides. Lizzie, what are they saying?
Well, let's start off with Leicester City, Manish. We've got one here from Jack and Justin in Mount Sorrel. They say, Nigel Pearson is the new Martin O'Neill for Leicester City. His team selection last season was spot on, and they were spot on again today. Well done, City. We've got a West Brom fan here, Mark, who predicts that West Brom will win the championship, and Newcastle United will go straight back up as well. And he adds, I do hope the two get it sorted, though, because it's such a shame. Oh. Another Newcastle fan here, uh, Tony from Nottingham, says, actually, he, no, he's a neutral. He says, Alan Shearer must be given the job he clearly deserves, I'm a Liverpool fan, but as a neutral, any fan like me must say the same. Well, Michael here, who is from Newcastle and is a Newcastle fan, says, good result away from home, no manager, most top players not there anymore. Shearer is the only man for the job. Now, let's go to Middlesbrough. And Scott from Norton on Tees says, I was a little bit disappointed with last night's performance, a poor start to the championship campaign. And finally, this one's for you guys in the studio. Steve from Middlesbrough says, Middlesbrough won't win without a target man. Do you have any thoughts, Ian? and Steve on who would be a suitable one for Southgate to bring in. All right, come on then, what do you think? Because they've got Emnez and Ali Adier yeah. up front. Yeah. What about the target, man? Because they've lost Mido, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, we're looking at the game last night, it, it almost looked as if Ems, I'm not sure that he knew what he was going to do with it, much less his, mm. his, his teammates. And Ali Adier almost has forgotten how to play that role up front. So um, if you're looking for a target, man, it's, it's very difficult to single someone out. Probably someone... in. The, in Rob Hulse, something like that, who's, who's, who's got goals in him, but also can hold the ball up for you. Ollie? Yeah, I'm sure Darby will have something to say about yeah. that, mate. You know? <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's going to be tough for Middlesbrough. You know, the fans were booing last night with a, with a, with a draw at home. You know, they've got to realise that they might not be famous anymore. They've just got to get behind their team. And um, they have got some good players, but to actually pick out a, a centre-forward of that ilk these days... There's not many of those around. You, if you're going to get out of this league, they've got to find someone who's going to get them 15, 20 yeah. goals, Ollie, haven't they? Yeah. They're not going to get out of this league without you think somebody... Of the, of the three relegated sides, they're going to struggle the most to get back up? Well, as I say, if they can get somebody who can score them a goal, they look well organised, they worked mm -hmm. hard yesterday, and they look difficult to break down. You know, midfield was fine, they had good width, and the defence were, were, were strong, but you've got to have a cutting edge, and if they don't get that, then they probably won't get promoted back up. OK. Now, Southampton start the season on minus 10 points, so they were hoping to get off to a good start against beaten playoff finalists Millwall. Chris Perry had struck the post for the Saints in the first half. Before Matt Patterson clipped the ball home from close range to give his side the lead. Wayne Thomas's trip on Jason Price earned Millwall a penalty. And second look, I'm not entirely sure by this one. Now the boys here also agree, but Alan Dunn's low spot kick was saved while Price's follow-up was also blocked. Well done, the keeper, but Najim Abdu's looping header rescued a point for Millwall as Southampton moved to minus nine. Still a long way to go. Right, here's the best of the rest from Coca-Cola League One. This was Charlton's first game at this level in almost three decades, and they'd never met Wickham in the league. Veteran defender Christian Daly opened the scoring on his debut for Charlton, and within a couple of minutes it was 2-0. The Addicts' top scorer last season, Nicky Bailey, doubling the home side's lead, Charlton seemingly cruising. But the visitors, two divisions below their opponents this time last year, halved the deficit shortly before the break. Chris Zabrowski's header putting Wickham back into contention. On 50 minutes, the two-goal lead was restored by another debutant. Miguel Lira started his career in Spain with Recreativo. After a detour through Milton Keynes, he's now proving popular in south-east London. But Wickham and Zabrowski in particular weren't finished. The former Millwall striker made it 3-2 with 17 minutes left. Some late nail-biting for Charlton, but they held on. After losing Fabian Dauf to Aston Villa, the importance of keeping Jermaine Beckford has never been higher for Leeds. 34 goals last season, and off the mark just 30 minutes into this one. A wonderful finish. The summer hasn't interrupted his eye for goal. Exeter's job became much harder after half-time. Striker Barry Corr sent off for hitting Michael Doyle. A needless red card, leaving his team with a mountain to climb. But after two successive promotions, Exeter have their fair share of quality too. Alex Russell's equaliser on 73 minutes, quite brilliant. 
it was almost enough for a point. That was until Beckford Hoos scored the winner two minutes from time. The only downside for Leeds, the transfer window is still open. There was no fairy tale return to Milton Keynes for manager Paul Ince, his Dons and Hartlepool effectively cancelling each other out. Jason Punchon's free kick was the closest either side came to a goal. Both seemed happy to settle for a point. Walsall are fast becoming Brighton's bogey team. Last season they won it with Dean despite playing for an hour with just nine men. This time they clinched the points thanks to a dreadful misunderstanding at the back. Andy Wing heading past his own keeper. Brighton dominated the second half but just couldn't find an end product. This miss from Nicky Forster summed up their day. Leighton Orient's 6-1 thrashing of Newcastle in pre-season has raised hopes in the East End, and they looked impressive against Bristol Rovers. JJ Melligan putting the ball past Rovers keeper Fraser Foster, who just happens to be on loan from Newcastle. But a minute before half-time, Rovers were level. Ricky Lambert scored 29 league goals last season. He might get another 29 this year if he's given this much space. Ho's boss, Geraint Williams, managed to convince Chelsea to release Jimmy Smith on a permanent basis after he spent last season on loan, and Smith repaid that faith with the winning goal. Orient might be worth keeping an eye on. Brentford, so consistent on their way to the League Two title last season, had a long but very fruitful journey to Carlisle. The Cumbrians, who narrowly avoided relegation in May, were soon in trouble. Miles Weston heading the bees in front. But where last season Brentford's opponents might have crumbled, Carlisle came back strongly, and Sam Saunders' raised arms proved costly. Ian Hart made full use of the spot kick. Weston, though, wasn't finished. He spent the past few weeks maintaining he had no regrets over leaving Notts County just before Sven and all that cash arrived. After embarrassing Carlisle's new keeper, Lenny Pidgeley, it was clear he settled quickly. Pidgeley didn't have his best day, though his teammates must surely take the majority of the blame for Brentford's third. Sam Wood on target, as the London club maintained the considerable momentum built up at the end of last season. It was an early kick-off down at the Priestfield, and Gillingham were quickly out of the blocks against visitors Swindon. They went 1-0 up after a good move was finished off by Mark Bentley, the first goal in the Football League this season. Gillingham, of course, came up via the League Two playoffs, beating Shrewsbury at Wembley with a goal from Simeon Jackson, and he was keen to carry on where he left off to put the Jills two up early in the second half. Gillingham coach Mark Stimson says consolidation is the aim this season. He might want to revise that after his injury hit side effectively wrapped things up on 72 minutes. Adam Miller with the header. And there was more to come. Five minutes from time, it was four. Jackson with his second of the game, a solo effort of genuine quality from the Canadian international. And there was still time for Gillingham to get a fifth and for Jackson to complete his first hat-trick for the club since his arrival in January. A wonderful start for the Jills, but Swindon boss Danny Wilson might have his work cut out this year. It's safe to say beginning the season in administration with their talented squad torn apart isn't the best base for Stockport to build on, so picking up a point at Boundary Park wasn't a bad start. The star of the show for new manager Gary Ablett was undoubtedly goalkeeper Owen Fon Williams, who time and again kept Oldham at bay. All too familiar for the Latics, who last won at home back in February. South End and Huddersfield just missed out on the playoffs last season, so both embark on the new campaign with optimism. Huddersfield were among the bookies' favourites, but it was the Shrimpers who were on the score sheet first after they were awarded a penalty when Anthony Grant was held back by Robbie Williams. Lee Barnard duly sent the keeper the wrong way, 1-0 South End.
into the second half and the home side went further ahead thanks to a goal from Belgian Frank Moussa. The 20-year-old signed a contract extension in the summer. South End fans will be glad he did. Town boss Lee Clark rang the changes to get them back into the game and it certainly had a galvanising effect. They pulled a goal back after 71 minutes through Anthony Pilkington and the equaliser came eight minutes later, scored by one substitute, Jordan Rhodes, after he was set up by another, Lee Novak. Rhodes is thought to be a hot prospect, likewise Huddersfield, who survived Michael Collins' late sending off without any scares. Plenty of Yeovil fans out to greet the new Tranmere boss. John Barnes always a popular figure, but a bit more popular in Somerset now than he'd like as his managerial reign at Rovers began with a defeat. Dean Bowditch on his debut got the opening goal and Tranmere's fate was sealed as Ryan Mason was upended right on the edge of the box. Inside in the ref's opinion and Gavin Tomlin kept his nerve. A promising start for Yeovil who hoped to avoid last season's struggles. Yeah, tough start for John Barnes there. Well, staying with League One, and uh, as far as Brian Gunn's Norwich are concerned, they'll be looking to bounce straight back after a disastrous season in the Championship. They kicked off their campaign with a tasty local derby with Colchester. Relegation hit hard at Norwich, down in the third tier of English football for the first time in 50 years. But with 12 new signings and more than 18,000 season ticket holders, Delia Smith could afford a smile. City widely tipped for a swift return to the Championship. Nobody was grinning for long. After just ten minutes, John Otsemabor welcomed new keeper Michael Theocletus with a woefully under-hit back pass. Kevin Lisby took advantage. If that was a shock for Norwich, nothing could have prepared them for what happened next. Just three minutes later, Lisby had Gary Doherty frantically chasing back. An easy step inside, and Clive Platt pounced on the rebound. Some start for Colchester, who 16 months ago were trounced 5-1 in their last trip to Carrow Road. They were taking their revenge in style. On 19 minutes, it was 3-0, Platt's second of the game, and Norwich's nosedive showed no sign of stopping. A powerful free kick from David Fox made it four, the teams only midway through the first half. All too much for some supporters, one appeared to throw his season ticket at manager Brian Gunn. Being a club legend counts for nothing when your side's being ripped to shreds. To really rub salt in the wound, Lisby, a former Ipswich player who'd also spent time at Norwich on loan, took the half-time score to 5-0. The match, of course, was dead and buried, and the stands already emptying by the time sub Cody McDonald pulled one back 18 minutes from the end. A mere blip in Colchester's extraordinary afternoon. It took them only three minutes to restore the five-goal gap. David Perkins beating Theocletus this time. The Australian keeper will certainly never forget his debut, no matter how hard he tries. Completing one of the most surprising scorelines of any opening day, Scott Vernon added the seventh in stoppage time. Norwich hadn't conceded that many since 1992, and that was in the Premier League away at Blackburn. A stunning result for Colchester, who've already got everyone reassessing the promotion race. I know the game's late, it's, it's really unpredictable at times. We were excellent, I thought the way we played the game. We looked a threat the whole the whole time. Yeah, the fans are disappointed, and um, you know we've seen it happen in the past in football, and uh, you know teams have gone on and uh, been successful from there. So, um, you know that's the uh, um, you know the sort of the fillet for me now is to is to make sure that um, we never see a performance like that again. And uh, the next time we go on the pitch, um, we, you know we pick a team that's going to win a match and uh, compete uh, with a lot of tough teams in, in League One. No, you're, you're just actually, the lads were brilliant. That's they're, they're the ones that obviously I said last season. The most important people at the football club are the players and the fans. I mean, when you've dropped down a division, it's vital you get off to a winning start. But that was disastrous for Norwich, wasn't it? Yes, I think the most damning indictment of all was when he said, I'm going to pick a team next Brian time. Brian Gunn. Yeah, Brian Gunn that competes. You know, there, there's no excuse. We all have bad games, but there's no excuse for not competing. One positive thing to come out of it is that the last time Norwich got beaten like that, was when they finished third in the Premier League and Brian Gunn was actually playing and they went on to I think to qualify for Europe. Europe. So 
Long season. Yeah, and we know about the Bayern Munich game and the rest Absolutely. of it. Yeah. Uh, Oli, what happens when someone like Brian Gunn, you're in the manager's dugout, fans get down there, throw their season tickets at you. That happened to you at QPR, didn't it? Yeah, we, we, um, we were nil-nil for 75 minutes and then um, Rob Earnshaw scored a hat-trick in the last few minutes and some woman come along and threw me her season ticket and started swearing at me and I just said, I'm all that love and a bag of chips, you know, you just got to get on with it. You yeah. Know? It doesn't, you can't take that emotion. He's got to look at the team, he's got to look at, and he's got to try and change a losing mentality into a winning mentality, and that's not easy. You can't take away the fact that it was a fantastic performance from Colchester, yeah. but obviously it was Norwich's defending that ultimately let them down. Yes, um, it, it, it looked, it, it, I mean, this is a, an appalling start in it. Oh, I've got Semmer ball there. I mean, what sort of back pass is that? I'm not sure the keeper knows exactly what he's doing with the ball. But it's a terrible start. And I mean, the, the next two or three goals were, were, were pretty decent goals. I think this is over the fourth or the fifth. Now, this is just a header at the near post from Platt, and Lisby just helps it on again. And there's hardly anybody actually making a worthwhile challenge there. And, you know, if you're going to have people who are going to score goals against you, come off the pitch and there's very little we could do about that. You know, these two or three goals that we're seeing here, I mean, that, that's woeful defending. It's just not enough. It's not professional enough. And you're not doing enough to put the opposition off. And if you're going to do that, and defend like that, you're going to concede goals. There's no doubt about that. Right, before we saw the Norwich game, we also saw Gillingham put five past Swindon. Terrific performance from Mark Stimson's side. But let's see whether Norwich fans have been texting or emailing us. Uh, Lizzie, I hear they've been strangely subdued. <laughs> well, we've actually had quite a few. Mostly, I'm afraid, not in favour of Brian Gunn remaining at the club. But we've actually had a few that have been in favour. I'll come to them now. We've got Mark in Brighton said, Norwich were terrible today. Even Delia will struggle to inspire that bunch. Uh, James texted to say, please, Brian Gunn, step down. You are not a manager and never will be. I have never been more embarrassed than I was today. But Josh from Lutterworth emailed to urge Norwich City fans to stick with Brian Gunn. He says, I've renewed my season ticket and there were still positives to take from today. Keep the faith in Gunn and he'll win us promotion. Mm. OK, thanks for that, Josh. We've got a, a, a Gillingham fan here who's pretty pleased with the 5-0 thrashing over Swindon. Kay and Young, he wrote in to say, I went to watch Gillingham today and I think they showed everyone they deserve to be in League One. They didn't even have their strongest squad out. I love this Stockport text. It's anonymous, but it says, please don't show the Owain von Williams world-class save from Stockport to Oldham today, as the big clubs will be sniffing around him. Shh. Oh, dear. I think we uh, may have already shown that one. And uh, finally, there's another one for you, uh, Ian and Steve. Georgie is emailed to ask what they think of the Brentford manager, Andy Scott, not just on today's performance, but the signings he's made, and with very little budget. Is he a manager for the future? His stock is certainly rising. One for Absolutely. the future. I did my A-license with, a license with Andy, um, and he has done exceptionally well on, as I said, a, a reasonably small budget as well. Ollie, briefly. Yeah, he's a great fella, and he d deserves to move on with Brentford this. Yeah. I think they'll go up again. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. OK. Now, Sven Joran Eriksson might be a surprise choice as Notts County's new director of football, but Sven is getting involved in the oldest team in the Football League, almost as old as Mark Clement. Notts County have been around so long, they initially had to devise their own version of the game. They're even credited with inventing the offside trap. Shame they couldn't have explained it to the rest of us. With 12 promotions and 15 relegations, no club has moved between the divisions of the Football League more than them. Did you know that Italian giants Juventus wear their famous black and white striped shirts having been sent a set of county strips at the start of the last century? Three sides of Meadow Lane were rebuilt in just six weeks in 1992. Oh, look at that. I'm just giving Sven's seat in the director's box a quick clean. We don't want him messing up his fancy Italian suit. There have been bright new beginnings at Meadow Lane before. In 2002, the ground was renamed the Aaron Scargill Stadium for a few weeks until the club's new sponsors went bust. Let's hope that Sven's reign lasts a little longer. Well, Sven's reign began very brightly at Meadow Lane, where Bradford City were the visitors. County fielded eight new signings, one of whom, Ben Davis, opened the scoring within 17 minutes of the Swede taking his seat. The vast majority and a bumper crowd of over 9,000 were on their feet again on 39 minutes, as new signing Lee Hughes rounded Simon Eastwood to roll in his first goal for County. Clearly, Hughes still has that magic touch in front of goal, if not on the dance floor. 
His second followed soon after, and it owed much to the quality of fellow debutant Craig Westcar, whose teasing cross was bundled home by the veteran frontman shortly before the break. Three nil at half time, County were awarded a penalty when another new boy, Luke Rogers, was upended on 54 minutes. Hughes grabbed the ball and sent Eastwood the wrong way to complete his hat trick. There was another shout for a penalty in the ensuing celebration. The Magpies' last one on the opening day back in 2000, and this 5 0 drubbing of Bradford City was rounded off by a quality finish from on loan signing Brendan Maloney, a defender, believe it or not. A dream start for promotion favourites County, whose manager was keen to single out his new midfielders. I think they're the unsung heroes, you know, Hughes got his goals. But my, uh, my two midfielders and uh, Westgard on the right, I thought were uh, magnificent. So the Sven era gets underway with a win for County, and don't forget how well he started under, at Manchester City two seasons ago. Well, here's the best bits now from League Two. A new manager, a new experience for Burton Albion. Paul Pescasolido in charge for the club's first ever Football League game in its 59-year history. A tricky opener too, with Shrewsbury one of the favourites for promotion after missing out in May's playoff final. Jake Robinson's goal, ten minutes into his debut, signalled the Shropshire club's intent to make it another successful season. And four minutes after the break, Shrewsbury stretched their lead, Dave Hibbert on target for the first time in almost a year. Midway through the second half, Burton were back in with a shout. Substitute Greg Pearson had only been on the pitch five minutes when he wrote his name into the club's record books, their first Football League scorer. But still time for Joss Labadee to catch out keeper Shane Redmond, who, like his teammates, had learned a lesson or two. He's a young lad, you know, we got to keep, keep, keep him positive, you know. We're not going you know, to worry too much about his errors because uh, we'll all make errors throughout the season. It's, it's part and parcel of football. I wish them all the best now that we've took the three points off them today. And, uh, you know, history over the last few years has shown that the teams coming out of the conference make a, a good fist of it in, the, in the, the League Two. And I'm quite sure that they'll do the same. Bournemouth produced one of the results of the day at Bury. Last season's top scorer, Brett Pittman, celebrated signing a new three-year contract by setting them on their way with his superb 17th-minute opener. Bury won 14 home matches last season, more than any other team in League Two, as they just missed out on automatic promotion. But they were always up against it once 37-year-old Steve Fletcher headed home his 93rd league goal for the Cherries, six minutes from half-time. And the points were sealed five minutes after the break when Mark Molesley powered home an angled shot from 25 yards out. Last season, the Cherries began facing a 17-point deficit. This year, they could be one of the division surprise packages. Darlington only came out of administration on Friday, but their on-field fortunes show no sign of improving just yet. Only three minutes gone when Marvin Morgan gave Aldershot the lead. And on the half hour, Darlow's plight worsened as keeper David Knight presented Andrew Sandell with an opportunity not to be missed. The shots were rarely threatened, but did survive one big scare. Jeff Smith's effort ruled out for a foul in the build-up. Just two minutes into the second half, there was definitely no more hope for the Northern club. Louis Soares defying the tight angle to put the game out of reach. Darlington could at least claim the best goal of the match. Some tidy football allowing David Dowson to provide some small consolation for the 200 ultra-loyal fans who travelled. Martin Allen's Cheltenham Town had to come from behind to beat Grimsby at Wadden Road, although the visitors can lay claim to scoring the best team goal of the day. An eight-pass move culminating in Barry Conlon's close-range tap-in. Echoes of Argentina in the last World Cup. Well, if you use your imagination. The Robins levelled 11 minutes after the break, and it came from an unlikely source. Left-back Lee Ridley, of all people, firing home his first goal for the club. His first goal for anybody in nearly four years, for that matter. The winner was rather more conventional. 37-year-old Barry Hales has carved out a pretty good career for himself with finishes like this. Cheltenham's League Two campaign off to a great start. 
John Nurse did nothing for the well-being of the crew defence with a spectacular volley to give Dagenham and Redbridge the lead at Gresty Road. Crew's equaliser wasn't bad either. Byron Moore helping them to adjust to their first season in the bottom tier for 15 years. But Dagenham were one of the most improved sides in League Two last term. And keeping top scorer Paul Benson has been a huge bonus. He was straight back in the groove with the winner. An entertaining match at Christie Park saw visitors Hereford draw first blood on 39 minutes, a confident low shot from Mark Pugh breaking the deadlock. But the Shrimps responded well, and just four minutes later they were level. Craig Stanley would have enjoyed this one against his former club. And the home side maintained their momentum in the second half, Stuart Drummond giving them the lead with a powerful far post header from Mark Duffy's cross. But in the final minute, Pugh levelled things up with his second of the match. Hereford fans no doubt delighted that he's made last season's loan deal permanent. Torquay's return to the league after a two-year absence was marked with an eye-catching opener. Danny Stevens surged into the box and a neat one-two with Nicky Rowe teed up Scott Rendell. Off the mark just 15 minutes into his debut on loan from Peterborough. Last season, Rendell's 15 goals for Cambridge United helped them to the Blue Square Premier Playoff final, where they were pipped to promotion by Torquay, who on this evidence can look forward to an enjoyable season. Lee Mansell's header had them firmly in control 19 minutes from time. Not that it was all one-way traffic. Chesterfield's performance was bright and lively in spite of a scoreline. They just didn't... as even at Vale Park where visitors Rochdale took a 66 minute lead courtesy of a powerful header at the back post from Joe Thompson that woke the home side up but their equaliser came in controversial circumstances Nathan Stanton was adjudged to have handled James Laurie's cross by the referee's assistant and from the resulting spot kick Mark Richards Vale's top scorer last season made no mistake the result just about right Barnett struggled last season but started brightly enough this time around at sunny Sinsel Bank. On loan Plymouth midfielder Yannick Balassi brought the best out of Lincoln keeper Robert Birch. Ultimately though one goal was enough. Defender Yanis Kovac cursing the woodwork one moment but thankful for it the next. His second attempt in off the post to break Barnett's resistance just before the hour and there was no way back for the Londoners. Rotherham start the new season as one of the favourites for promotion. Perhaps that pressure of expectation helps explain a nervous-looking opening against Accrington Stanley. Keeper Andy Warrington sparing the blushes of his defenders here with a smart save from Stanley's Jimmy Ryan. With time running out, Rotherham launched one last attack. And after some head tennis in the penalty area, Ian Sharps thought he'd broken the deadlock with a stinging volley, only for the woodwork to intervene. The visitors failed to clear and the ball fell to Paul Warren, back with the Millers after leaving them four years ago. A cool finish, producing an 89th-minute winner. After last season's points deduction, Mark Robbins' men are already 17 points better off than this time last year. Northampton have revamped their side since relegation. Five debutants in the starting lineup against Macclesfield. Dean Beckwith almost drew first blood. It was a match packed with close shaves. Keith Alexander's side just as close to breaking the deadlock through Sean Brisley. And while Northampton was still on the back foot, Colin Daniel managed to clip the woodwork too. They obviously weren't short of confidence. How about this in the second half from Rooney? Not Wayne, but his brother John, trying to make a name for himself. 
just as it seemed the game was sure to finish goalless, a golden chance in stoppage time for Steve Guinan, who's had a long and successful career finding the net, but couldn't this time. Well, that's League Two uh, rounded off, but I suppose the standout result has got to be Notts County against Bradford. I mean, it's all coming together. Sven off the pitch, five goals on it. And against very decent opposition, second in the, uh, in the bookmakers' list of uh, favourites to go up. So, you know, Bradford are the biggest team in that league. They're the best supported. Um, and that, that's a fantastic marker for, for Notts, uh, Notts County to lay down. For the two new boys, as for Torquay, back after... Uh, in the conference, after they're in the conference or the Blue Square Premier, and off to a winning start, terrific. Yeah, for Paul Buckle. Paul Buckle's done really well there, you know, and they, they they've managed to drag themselves back in, and that's a fantastic mm. result on the first game because normally you're a little bit worried at how we're going to do. Mm. They, they played so well with so much fluency. It's brilliant, well done. And for Burton, Paul Pesky Solido. I mean, there's been a lot of attention for them back in the league after yeah. what first time in 59 years, mm. but. Not off to a winning start. No, I mean going to Shrewsbury was always going to be a tough, tough ask. I mean they, they just missed out last year, and you know although they lost Grant Holt, they kept the majority of the side yeah. that did so well. So that was a tough, tough ask. Okay, let's see what League Two fans are saying on the emails and texts, Lizzie. Well, Manish, they've been very busy, like all the fans tonight. I've got to start, of course, with Notts County. Steve says, a great performance by Notts County. And it should be noted that Ian McParland's good work putting the team together was done pre-Sven. We've got a Torquay United good fan point. here. Stephen in yes. Chipping Norton says, what a great day for Chris Todd of Torquay United. He beats leukaemia and then helps Torquay to three points in their first game back in the league. Sam, who's a Lincoln fan, reckons it was the Lincoln City Passionista supporters who sucked the ball into the net after, after half-time not Kovacs. Well, I think there are a few teams in the league that could do with the passionista fans to suck the ball in. Ash in Burnley says, the omens are good. Accrington only lost 1-0. Go on, Stanley. And finally, Darren from Liverpool emailed to say, we're so lucky in this country. The football leagues look fantastic. It's going to be an interesting year. It certainly is. Thanks for those emails and those texts. I'll see you soon. Thanks very much, Lizzie. Well, let's see what all that means for the various league tables. Early days for them, perhaps but it gives us a chance to show off our new graphics at the top of League Two. A great start to the season for Notts County. A special mention, of course, to Sven Joran Eriksson and their manager, Ian McParland, and a hat-trick boy, Lee Hughes, means their top. Bournemouth, well, what a difference 12 months makes for Eddie Howe, the league's uh, youngest manager, of course. They were going back from 19 points at the start of last season. They're second on the opening day. And for all the shots, Shrewsbury, Torquay, Cheltenham, Dagenham and Redbridge, Lincoln and Rotherham winning starts for all those sides. At the bottom of uh, the Football League, well, Bradford, the bookies' favourites to go straight back up. No points for them. And also for Berry, also many people's favourites, to go up to League One. At the top of League One, this is how it looks. Colchester, 12 months is a long time for them. They were bottom this time last year. They're top, the courtesy of an opening day win. Gillingham, well, they, of course, promoted to the league and a great start to life in League One for them. Special mentions, too, for Brentford, Yeovil, Charlton and Leeds. Two sides, of course, and the bookies' favourites for a return to the Championship.